Okay, welcome. So in this video, we are going to do some examples using Taylor series to show how we can represent functions using them. So this is where Taylor series really are powerful and seem like they have some use in my opinion. So what we're gonna do is two examples and we're gonna find Taylor series representations for sine of x and e to the x. So the idea here is that sine and e to the x are more complicated functions. So sometimes it might come in handy to have a different representation for sine or e to the x, a different way to write it that maybe is easier for us to compute, easier for us to work with, somehow is more useful to us than just e to the x and sine of the x. The Taylor series can give us a lot more information, a lot more to work with, a lot more to manipulate. Okay, let's see what this looks like. So let's write f of x equals sine x as a Taylor series centered at x equals zero. And because it's centered at x equals zero, this is really a Maclaurin series. Okay, so we know it's going to have the form of the sum from n equals zero to infinity of c sub n times x minus zero to the n. This is my power series, and it becomes Taylor series when I use my specific formula for the coefficients. So my coefficients are the nth derivative of f at zero divided by n factorial, and then now I'm multiplying by x to the n. So to find our specific coefficients for this case with sine, I'm gonna make a table and we're gonna just find the coefficients for n from zero to five. So we're gonna just find some of them. We're gonna see if we can figure out a pattern. We're gonna look at the graph. We're just gonna sort of explore what this can do for us. Okay, so I'm gonna find the first two columns at the same time. I just think it's easy that way. So remember, I'm starting with the function f so for n equals zero, this is just the function, it's just sine of x, and then sine at zero is zero. So that's my first thing where n is zero. Then for n equals one, I'm taking the first derivative of f, the derivative of sine is cosine, and then cosine at zero is one. Okay, n equals two, second derivative. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. When I evaluate negative sine at zero, I'm still getting zero. Third derivative of f is negative cosine. So I'm taking the derivative of negative sine, I'm getting negative cosine. Evaluating that at zero, I'm getting negative one. So here's where we're gonna start seeing some repeats. So the fourth derivative is the derivative of negative cosine, which is just sine, and we're back to where we started. So sine of zero is zero. Now let's just do this for the fifth derivative just to see. So the fifth derivative is cosine, cosine at zero is one. So I'm finding the first few terms, and I did this many just because so many of them are gonna end up being zero, since the derivative at zero is zero in many of these cases. Okay, so this last part is pretty tedious, but bear with me. So I'm taking the previous column, the nth derivative at zero, and I'm dividing by n factorial, and then I'm multiplying by x to the n. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write these out. I'm getting zero, then I'm getting x, then I'm getting zero again, then I'm getting negative x cubed over three factorial, then zero again, then x to the fifth over five factorial. So every other term is just zero, so only like the first, third, and fifth terms are getting me anything. Okay, so if we go ahead and write this out, I'm writing that sine of x is equal to this infinite series, x minus x cubed over three factorial, plus x to the fifth over five factorial, and then we can assume that the next term is x to the seventh over seventh factorial, etc. So this series continues infinitely to represent sine centered at x equals zero, and then I'm gonna just write this as a series for you. Determining how to do this takes its own work and its own practice, but we're writing it as the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n over two n plus one factorial, times x to the 2n plus 1. So you can check this for yourself if you want. Start at n equals 0, plug it in, make sure you're getting the first term. Then n equals 1, make sure you're getting the second term, etc. But for now, I hope you can just trust me. Okay, so our claim is that sine is going to be represented by this infinite series, which we have written here. And so I want to show you the graph just to show you what some of this looks like. So when we start with x as our first term. This would be the first degree Taylor polynomial since it's just got the x. So this looks like it is pretty close to sine when we're near zero. 
So it sort of aligns with the sine function when we're centered at that zero point, but as we move further away, it doesn't really match it anymore. But as we add more terms, as we increase the degree of the Taylor polynomial, this should look even closer to what we want. So as I add the second term in, minus one over three factorial times x cubed, I'm seeing that the shape aligns a little bit better. And when I continue, I add one over five factorial x to the fifth, we're getting even closer. So we can go further out and still have it being matching the sine function we started with. Then I'm just gonna put one more term in, minus one over seven factorial x to the seventh, and you see it goes even closer. So you can imagine if we did this infinitely, if we had an infinite number of terms, this would eventually perfectly match our sine function. So I set up a little animation here. It's gonna go from one term to 10 terms, and I'm using that formula that I showed previously. So we're looking at the sums, and you can see as the top bound increases, the more terms we have, the more accurate it gets. Pretty cool. So that's how the series representation for sine might come in handy. It will approximate the function, and the more terms we include, the further away it is still matching it. But when we're really close to a certain value, like if we only are really looking around x equals zero, we don't need as many terms to do a good job of matching the function. Okay, so let's do another example. This time we're gonna write the function g of x equals e to the x as a Taylor series center at zero. So again, we're just centering at zero to keep it simple. So this is really a Maclaurin series. Now I can write out what this is going to look like and what the formula is for the coefficients. And we're gonna follow the same process as the previous example and start to find the specific coefficients so that we can look at part of the series representation. Okay, so we're gonna do zero through five again. We could keep going if we wanted, but I think five will be enough for us to see what's going on. And something that's happening that is neat here with the e to the x function is its derivatives are all e to the x. So everything in this column is e to the x. And so when I evaluate at zero, I should be getting the same thing. I'm getting e to the zero, which is one, and that repeats. So all of my derivative values at zero are just one. Okay, so then if we look at the things we're summing up, I'm gonna write them all out here. I'm doing one over zero factorial x to the zero, that's just one. One over one factorial x to the one, that's just x. One over two factorial x squared, that's x squared over two factorial, etc. So these are the terms of my Taylor series representation of e to the x, and we're gonna do the same thing as we did before. So let's write them all out. So I'm saying that e to the x is equal to one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial, etc. And we do that an infinite number of times, and we can then write this as the sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. This one's a little easier to see that this is the way we would write the series. So if you watched one of my previous videos, I talked about the sum one over n factorial being equal to e, and this is why. You can imagine if we plug in one for x, we're getting one over n factorial, and that's what's happening here, and that's why that statement is true. So let's look at some graphs. I'm going to just slowly include more terms of the Taylor series and see how this better approximates the function as we increase the number of terms. So I'm doing one, then one plus x, then I'll add x squared over two factorial, again, x cubed over three factorial, and then x to the fourth over four factorial. And we're seeing it matches pretty well. Then I can also set up a little animation here with the sum x to the n over n factorial. And we can see as a increases, this is getting closer and closer to the function e to the x. You can imagine if we did this an infinite number of times, it would perfectly approximate the function. Okay, so that is a little bit about Taylor series and how they can be used. Hopefully that also showed you how to find the coefficients and to find what we are summing up as part of the Taylor series. Again, this is just a little introduction into what Taylor series can do and how they work. So I hope that was a little interesting for you to see how Taylor series might approximate functions. Thanks so much for watching and I will talk to you in the next one.